言い訳ねえだろうええじゃないかデビュー This is Edge Nika. Of the nearly 600 roller coasters I've ridden around the globe, it's both my favorite and also the most insane roller coaster I've ever experienced. On most roller coasters, your riding position is always fixed in the forward or sometimes backwards direction. But Edge and Nika's seats spin both forward and backwards, so your riding position is constantly changing. The ride is known as a fourth dimension roller coaster, where the fourth dimension is spin rather than time. The spinning of the ride's seats adds an extra layer of motion to what is already a crazy roller coaster, such as a rapid front flip that occurs on the nearly straight down drop. In this video, I'll be describing just what it's like to ride Edge and Nika, and why I believe it's the most Most insane roller coaster in the world. The ride is so crazy that some of you may love it as much as I do, and others may despise it for being too much. And of course, we'll take a look at some of the technical aspects of the coaster to give you an idea about how this mammoth roller coaster operates, as well as some background on its history. If you guys wouldn't mind, please hit the like button as that helps the channel greatly against the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's dig in. Edge and Nika is located in Japan at an amusement park called Fujiq Highland, which is right near the base of Mount Fuji. If you're ever visiting Japan, I highly recommend taking a train or bus to visit the park. It's about a two hour bus ride from most parts of Tokyo. Or better yet, if you live in Japan, I'm very jealous of you. Edge and Nika was designed by Alan Shilke, the same man who designed the prototype Fourth Dimension roller coaster X at Six Flags Magic Mountain in California, which now goes by the name X2. X was built by Aerodynamics, a pioneer in the amusement. Industry. The company unfortunately went bankrupt during the construction of X in late 2001. This led to another ride manufacturer by the name of SNS Worldwide to purchase some of Aerodynamics assets in late 2002. SNS took Aero's fourth dimension roller coaster and improved the product, which led to the creation of Edge and Nika. Fujiq Highland has always strived to build some of the world's most impressive and record breaking roller coasters, like the infamous Moonsault Scramble in 1983, which was technically the world's first roller coaster, although not a complete circuit, to reach a height over 200 feet or 61 meters, or Dodo Dompa, which opened in 2001 and launches riders from 0 to 112 miles per hour or 180 kilometers per hour in 1.6 seconds. When the park opened at Janica, it was the world's tallest, fastest, and longest fourth dimension roller coaster. And today, it still remains the tallest and longest of the three fourth dimension roller coasters in existence. The ride has a length of 3,782.2 feet, or 1,152.8 meters, reaches a top speed of 78.3 miles per hour, or 112 kilometers per hour, and stands at a height of 249.3 feet, or 76 meters. Edge and Nika is situated in the northwest corner of Fujiq Highland, right next to the park's second entrance, where a train station is conveniently located for. Park access. The coaster is actually built right alongside the town of Fujiyoshida and can be seen from the city streets. But much of the ride still interacts within the amusement park and its pathways, and you are able to stand almost directly underneath the first drop as you watch riders somersault their way down. You also walk directly underneath one of the ride's high speed valleys to access its entrance area in queue. Edge and Nika used to be even more integrated into Fuji Q's pathways when it first opened. There used to be a path beginning at this yellow Torii gate. It stretched its way between the coast. Ending elements and gigantic lift hill to the ride's actual entrance and queue. But this pathway has been closed for years, and the park map no longer shows its existence. With Edge and Nika being one of Fuji Q's most popular rides, this path may have been closed off to keep guests in the park's other midways, where the chances of them buying food or merchandise is higher. Visually, Edge and Nika is intimidating. If you're familiar with X2, it looks like a slightly taller version of X2, but with a more menacing color scheme. The track is a dark black that almost looks brown in certain lighting, and the supports. Are a dark gray. In a sense, it's also a boring color scheme, as most of the other coasters at Fuji Q are either black, gray, or white. And Edge and Nika's original red track and black support color scheme probably gave a better splash of color to Fuji Q. But overall, I think the color scheme still makes Edge and Nika look intimidating and sleek. The ride structure is also insanely dense, and the track features two thick spines. This is because the ride's 20 foot or 6 meter wide trains are heavy, so the attraction requires a lot more support than most coasters. The support tubes on the ride Taller sections are massive, and during the valleys between elements, the number of supports present is crazy. When it comes to theming, Edge and Nika doesn't really have any. Thankfully, Fuji Q keeps everything well kept for the most part, unlike something at a crumbling Six Flags park, if you know what I mean. The station building is a plain, boxy green rectangle with a white pattern design, and the first portion of Q is a set of switchbacks placed on top of asphalt with no theming whatsoever, although there is a cool retractable awning when shade is necessary on hot days. After the initial set of switchbacks, the 
line divides into two, with one side ascending to the left side of the station, and the other ascending to the right. This is because each row of the train has two seats to the left of the track, and two seats to the right of the track, as you do not ride directly over the track like on most roller coasters, so riders need to be sent to both sides of the platform. If you can, I recommend taking the left path. The ramp that climbs to the station is located right next to a high speed valley of the coaster, which helps make the wait more exciting as you watch the massive heavy trains fly by. Unfortunately, the line for Ejunaika moves at a snail's pace, as it operates with only two 20 passenger trains, and dispatches are slow. When I visited, it took about 5 minutes between each dispatch, but I've heard from others that dispatches could take as long as even 7 minutes. I'll dive into why that is in a bit, but because of the slow operations, I highly recommend purchasing Skip the Line passes if you are traveling to Fuji-Q Highland from another country. The day we attended the park, Ejunaika had close to a 2 hour wait, as did the park's other major roller coasters. When our group arrived at Fuji-Q Highland, we purchased Zekio Priority Passes, which allow you to skip the line. When we attended in 2018, each pass was 1,500 yen, which is currently about 11 US dollars. Each Zekio Pass is good for one rider and one attraction, and you reserve which ride you want that pass to be good for, as well as an available 1 hour time slot to use that pass during. What's nice about the Zekio Passes are that they can help you get assigned towards the back rows of a coaster at Fuji-Q. At least that's what happened to us. Like almost all Japanese parks, ride attendants at Fuji-Q assign all guests a row to ride an attraction, and it's rude in Japan to question or argue the assignment you are given. When we attended in 2018, the ride attendants would first assign guests from the standby queue the front and middle rows of each train. They would then assign priority pass users to the back rows afterwards, basically guaranteeing a ride near the back of the train. And then besides priority boarding passes, Edge and Nika also has a single rider line, but there's no guarantee the single rider line will be shorter in duration than the standby line. Now even with the ride's slow operations, the park has an efficient way of preparing the next group of riders who will board the coaster. On each side of the platform are four boarding pens. 10 riders for that side of the train are assigned a row and proceed into one of the four pens where you find each row number marked on the ground. Each rider has a corresponding locker where you place your loose articles. Edge Nika has one of the strictest no loose article policies out there, so absolutely all bags, everything in your pockets, hats, and even jewelry must go in your locker. You must also remove your glasses even if they have a strap as well as your shoes which can be left on the ground over your row number. Thankfully, the lockers are completely free to use. You are provided a key to your locker that secures to your arm with a wristband that's tight enough to stay secure even while on the ride. You can see the key attached to my wrist here from this on-ride photo. With four boarding pens, there is always a group of riders empty of all loose articles and shoes who are ready to board. When a train returns to the station, the exiting guests will return to their boarding pen to retrieve their belongings as a group from a different boarding pen enters the load platform and gets into their assigned row. Your boarding pen then remains empty until you complete your ride. Here you can see two boarding pens with shoes on the ground. These are the two groups who are currently on the ride's two trains. Next is the fun part of securing your many restraints. Edge and Nika has the same seats and over the shoulder restraints as X2, but many more seatbelts. You begin by securing a seatbelt across your lap. You then pull your restraint down until it contacts your shoulders, and then you pull the two halves together until your upper body is securely in place. Then there is a seatbelt that connects the two halves of the restraint together, as well as another seatbelt that secures your restraint to the seat itself. The many ride attendants on the platform will then physically check your restraints and seatbelts. Afterwards, they instruct each row of riders to check their own restraints. Only then can the train be dispatched. This is a major reason why the dispatches can take so long. To be fair, the ride operators are not slow. They quickly and efficiently do their jobs with a hustle and are also highly enthusiastic and friendly. But the additional steps of securing and checking the abundant restraints is what makes operations slow. But what's most important is that the ride crew does a great job making sure you are safe and secure. Now your physical body is safe and secure, but Edge and Nika's endless number of seatbelts do nothing to keep your identity safe. That's why you need our video sponsor, Aura, an easy to use app that includes everything you need to stay safe online. Aura helped me discover that several of my passwords have been leaked in a data breach thanks to its ability to scan the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security number. This helps protect you from scammers and hackers as well as criminals who sell your stolen information. Aura can also help reduce the number of robocalls you receive by requesting the removal of your info from websites that make your personal information public. It can even give you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries, like if someone was 
as opening a loan or credit card in your name. Their VPN even allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. And it protects your devices from viruses, malware, spyware, and more so, the bad guys can't break in. Aura even helps you manage what your kids can do on their devices. You can restrict specific apps, set screen time limits, and even set focus times to ensure your child is doing their homework instead of binging YouTube learning about block zones. And Aura's password manager lets you store and access your online passwords securely and conveniently. You might already have an app that does one of these things, but with Aura, you don't have to download and pay for seven separate apps. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link. You'll be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over those two weeks. Go to Aura.com slash Altora Ryan to start your free trial. Also linked below in the description or scan the QR code. All right, now that your identities are also safe and secure, we can continue with our ride. As the ride crew dispatches the train, they begin clapping and chanting Ejunaika over and over. And from what I saw, the entire trainload of riders will join in every time. I've heard several English translations for the name Ejunaika. Phrases like, ain't it great, come on, it's okay, who cares, why not, or what the hell. From what I understand, the origins of the word Ejunaika in Japanese culture roots back to the late 1860s, during the end of the Edo period and the start of the Meiji Restoration. In 1981, a movie by the name of Ejunaika was released to showcase this cultural movement, although I hear it isn't completely accurate. Notice what they are chanting. In these times, there was a great amount of political and social upheaval, making life unstable and tense, and Ejunaika became a phenomenon across Japan. Ejunaika consists of carnivalesque religious celebrations and communal activities, often understood as social or political protests. And I guess a big part of that was chanting the phrase Ejunaika, which I guess the ride's name is an ode to, as well as the chant at dispatch. And it certainly ties to the many meanings of the phrase Ejunaika, where basically this ride is insane and let's send it. Yo, Anyway, the floor drops from beneath your feet and you are dispatched from the station facing backwards, where you descend a small dip into a right turn. The seats of the train rotate backwards, about 90 degrees, flipping you nearly upside down as you coast through the turn. It's a great warning of what's to come. The seats rotate back to a more upright position as the train engages the chain lift. Ejunaika's lift hill is very tall at 249 feet, or 76 meters, but the climb to the top takes just shy of one minute. In the meantime, you get a great view of the mountains north of the park if the weather is in cooperation that day. The train reaches the top of the lift, and the seats rotate slightly, placing riders on their backs as the train rides down a small pre-drop. The train then rides up into the apex of the first drop as the seats rotate forward to the point where you are laying down, staring over 240 feet or 73 meters at the ground below you. And with the track off to the side, there's nothing between you and the ground but your restraint and several seatbelts. The train quickly begins to accelerate down the drop, and riders in the back cars get a good amount of whip and airtime, which feels feels bizarre while laying down. As you descend the 89 degree drop, you remain laying down, staring at the ground approaching as if you're skydiving. SNS calls this first drop a skydive down drop, and while I've never gone skydiving before, it sounds incredibly accurate. Then right before the pullout, you perform a rapid front flip, placing you on your back for the transition out of the drop. This flip happens really late, much more so than it occurs on X2, and that actually freaked me out on my first ride. It almost felt as if our seats weren't going to flip in time for the pullout. The pull out into the first raven turn slams you with positive g-forces, and you ride through this transition tipped on your back instead of sitting upright like on most coasters. This makes the transition feel similar to a pretzel loop on a flying roller coaster built by B&M, which are extremely intense elements. The train rides up into a gigantic raven turn, which starts as a half vertical loop, but as the train nears the top, the seats begin rotating backwards while you simultaneously begin to feel weightless, as the top of this element is an airtime hill. The rotation continues, sending riders through a back flip as the train descends back to ground level. It feels completely disorienting as you experience airtime from the crest and drop of the raven turn, while at the same time you navigate through a backflip. Following the backflip, you are left riding underneath the track instead of above the track like before, and rather than facing backwards, you are now facing forward. If you're riding in car 1, it previously looked like you were at the rear of the train as you watched the cars behind you since you were facing backwards, and now it truly feels like you are at the front of the train as your viewpoint has shifted to facing forward. The train bottoms out, riding 
cutting through another pullout that again applies a high number of positive g-forces. You are also still tipped slightly on your back, making the forces feel crazier. This leads into one of the most disorienting moments of the entire roller coaster, what I believe is called a full full. The track winds through a zero-g roll as it rotates 360 degrees counterclockwise through an airtime hill. But the seats of your train begin to rotate through a front flip. As the train rotates through the first 180 degrees of the zero-g roll, your seat position changes from below the track and facing forward to above the track and facing backwards. And since you sit to either the left or right of the track, if you started the element with the track on your right, you flip to the other side of it or vice versa. So through the roll, you are shifted left or right by 20 feet or 6 meters, which is the width of the train, in addition to all the other motion already happening. Then as the train rotates through the remaining 180 degrees of the zero-g roll, it feels as if the seat rotation reverses, causing you to rotate in the opposite direction you were expecting to as you descend back to ground. And the same thing happens where you switch from riding on top of the track and facing backwards to now riding below the track facing forwards, as well as shifting 20 feet or 6 meters to the left or right. And through this whole element, you are completely weightless as you experience airtime as well as lateral forces while twisting and turning all over the place. And even with the track rotating through a 360 degree roll, your seat doesn't go upside down at all during this maneuver. By this point of the ride, I I was hysterically laughing at how insane it was, which is a reaction that no other roller coaster really manages to get out of me. The train rushes through another high speed pullout while you are tipped on your back, delivering another intense moment of positive g-forces. I love riding underneath the track as you whiz through the support beams that surround you at the top and the side. You ascend into a fast paced overbank turn, similar to the ones on Millennium Forest at Cedar Point, but at the top of the element your seats rotate backwards, changing your viewpoint from looking in the direction of the turn like a Millennium Forest, where your riding position is always fixed forward to suddenly looking at the center of the turn. This was an awesome surprise as it really jazzed up what I thought would be an ordinary overbank turn, and it gives a nice twist to a basic ride element. The train dives back to ground, with riders still positioned below the track facing forwards and tipped on their backs. You fly through another high speed pullout, racing through a series of steel support columns and part of the ride's queue is just to your left. Next is what I believe is called a half half. It's basically an airtime hill where the track rotates through a 180 degree roll, taking the train from riding beneath the track to above the track, but as you ride over the top of the hill and receive airtime, your seats rotate backwards, which shifts your riding direction from facing forward to facing backward, all while you are weightless and receive lateral forces. This was also one of, if not the strongest airtime moment that I found on the ride, and my legs really began to lift in the air as only your upper body is restrained. You descend back to ground, riding above the track and facing backwards as you hit another intense pullout that delivers high positive g-forces. You then begin the ride's absolutely insane ending. First First is another raven turn, but it's much smaller than the first one and the train rushes through it. The seats rotate forward as you hit the apex of the element so that you are laying down facing the ground, causing you to get pushed up into your seat instead of feeling the sensation of airtime. You then quickly descend through a half vertical loop which again flips the train from riding above the track and backwards to below the track and forward. This small raven turn sustains a high number of positive g-forces the entire way through as you bottom out only inches off the ground. Next is another half half up into the break run, similar to the half-half beforehand where your seats rotate through a backflip which flips your orientation to above the track and traveling backwards, all while receiving very strong airtime. And you also flip from the left side of the track to the right side, or vice versa. The train enters the brake run at a very high rate of speed, and as the train begins to slow down, the seats rotate forward, and it feels like your face will smack into the steel catwalk below. So even the brake run manages to feel absolutely insane, which is something that can't be said about most roller coasters. The seats then rotate upright as the train slows to a manageable pace and enters the station building ending the ride. Overall, Edge of Nika is an absolutely insane ride experience and something that makes it even crazier is that the ride isn't smooth. Because of the rotating seats that extend sideways from the train, they bounce up and down and shake back and forth. You can really feel them bouncing up and down during the ride's high speed pullouts or shaking back and forth while rotating. But sitting in the inside or outside seat can make a big difference, with the outside seat feeling far shakier. Personally, I preferred the outside seat, but I think most would prefer the inside seat for its slightly smoother ride. I also only rode the coaster in rows 4 and 5 
but thanks to the shorter trans in Ejinica, I'd imagine that all of the rows feel pretty consistent to each other. Riding the coaster on different sides of the train may also lead to different experiences. Both of my rides were on the left side of the train, and a ride on the right side is probably just as insane, or who knows, maybe it's even crazier. The only major downside, however, is that the coaster is rather short in duration, at just about 40 seconds from when you disengage the lift to when you hit the final brake run. But that might actually be a good thing, as the ride is so insane that if it were any longer, it would probably be way too much. And even with all of the ride's insanity, only your upper body is restrained, so there are a lot of moments where your legs are kind of flopping up and down due to all the g-forces. Now this didn't happen to me much on my rides, but your legs can slam into the plastic seating of the train, which isn't the most comfortable. Overall, I didn't find the leg slamming as bad as it can be on X2 at Six Flags Magic Mountain, and I also found Edge Nika to be smoother than X2, at least the smoothness of the seat rotation. But I've heard others say the opposite, so just be ready to be tossed around when you ride Edge Nika. And without question, Edge Nika is a wilder version of X2. Now don't get me wrong, X2 has some great qualities that Edge Nika lacks, like a longer train that really expands the dynamics of its first drop. On X2, the front of the train hangs at the top of the drop as it waits for the rest of the train, and you really get to stare at the ground below, and the rear of the train gets whipped extremely hard down the drop because of the longer train, where on Edge Nika, the shorter train means a more consistent ride for all rows with less hang time in the front and less whip in the back. But Edge Nika does take a lot of what I'd call the duller moments of X2 and makes them insane. On X2's first Raven turn, the seats don't rotate through a backflip, and you were able to get a grasp of what just happened on the first drop, and also watch the train transition from riding above the track and backwards to below the track and forwards, where on Edge of Nika, you do a backflip instead, which completely wrecks your opportunity to try and understand what is happening. Now, I've heard some say that they prefer the first Raven turn on X2, so this could be either way for you. The following element on X2 is sort of like a step up, almost like a double up into the ride's luge turn. But during this airtime hill, the seats rotate through a backflip, actually sending you upside down. I personally remember being unimpressed by this maneuver on X2, whereas on Edge of Nika, the full full has a full ascent and descent back to ground, thanks to a different placement of the ride's station building, and it's overall far more disorienting. The airtime also felt way more intense on Edge of Nika's equivalent hill, and all its changes in riding position and direction were way more insane. And since the full full drops to ground level, you are traveling at a far faster rate of speed in the next pullout compared to X2's equivalent pullout where you're traveling slower since you are higher in the air. I then found the following luge turn on X2 to be a dead spot as the train slowly coasts through a turnaround while your seats bobble up and down. Where on Edge of Nika, this is a fast paced overbank turn with seat rotation that starts and ends closer to ground level. Just to give a better idea of the intensity difference between X2's airtime hill and luge turn versus Edge of Nika's full full and overbank turn, on X2 these elements only have a single track spine as the elements produce less g-forces overall, where on Edge of Nika, both elements still sport the stronger dual track spine as there's a lot more g-forces. The following half-half on X2 picks the pacing and intensity back up again as you experience airtime while the train flips from riding below to above the track. But just like everything else so far, I found that Edge of Nika executed this element a lot faster, making it feel more intense. And then the final Raven turn on Edge of Nika is designed a lot better than X2's final Raven turn, which is something I plan to discuss more in detail in my eventual problematic roller coasters video on X2, as well as some other technological changes between X2 and Edge of Nika. Going back to Edge of Nika, the ending half-half into the brake run is taken far faster than X2's rather slow roll into the brake run, and the seat rotation during the brake run in Edge of Nika makes slowing down an actual ride element. So personally, I find Edge of Nika to be far superior to X2, but just for perspective, I actually found X2 underwhelming when I rode it in 2017. Don't get me wrong, X2 is a wonderful attraction, but I went on X2 expecting it to be absolutely wild based on what I had heard about it, and I was let down. Whereas Edge and Nika delivered that crazy ride experience I was expecting X2 to provide, and then some. And a lot of that had to do with the pacing of X2. I found that Edge and Nika just paces a lot better through its layout. Maybe it's the second generation 4th dimension trains that X2 runs with that make it slower. When X originally opened in 2002, it featured an even heavier fleet of trains.
Reigns. From videos that I've seen online, it appears that X ran a good amount faster than XT on average. But ironically, Edge and Nika also opened with the same heavier fourth dimension coaster trains in 2006, and it ran those trains until about 2014 or 2015. Afterwards, the ride began operating the lighter second generation fourth dimension coaster trains that X2 runs. But Edge and Nika still feels like it runs far too fast, even with its lighter set of trains. And then this is more of a cosmetic difference, but Edge and Nika features additional fiberglass on its trains that cover the center bodies of each car, while X2 does not. On Edge and Nika, these fiberglass panels are what give the trains their blue, red, or yellow colors. I also really like how the steel chassis of Edge and Nika's trains are painted black, compared to the light gray color of X2 steel chassis. Either way, I doubt the paint color and weight of the extra fiberglass on Edge and Nika's trains cause it to run that much faster. Edge and Nika was probably just designed to run faster from the start. Anyway, a lot of people swear by X2 and see it as one of the world's best roller coasters, which is why I so desperately want to re-ride X2 to see if it stacks up better against Edge and Nika. I attempted to get back on X2 in January of 2022, but the ride was closed due to wind. As far as the rotation of Edge and Nika's seats, that is all controlled through the entire track layout. Unlike SNS's newer 4D free spin coasters, where the spinning of seats is both uncontrolled and enhanced with the use of magnets. On Edge and Nika, there are two additional rails alongside the two road rails. The two road rails carry the load of a coaster train, but the two additional rails are for seat rotation. These rails vary in distance from the road rails, which actually moves a set of wheels that ride along the seat rotation rails. As the seat rotation rails move up or down, it moves the wheels, which spins a racket gear, causing the seats of the train to rotate forward or backwards. Let's take a look at the ride's block zones. For those who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. While I do not have direct confirmation on this, I believe Agenica's block zones are as follows. First is the station, followed by the main lift hill. Next is the safety brake run, followed by the ready brake run where the transfer track is, so a total of four block zones. Technically, this is enough block zones for the ride to run three trains, which the park actually owns, but I believe it was intended for the ride to only operate with a max of two trains. This is evident by the storage track that only has room to hold one train transferred off the circuit, rather than at least two trains if three train operations were possible. But since Fuji Q Highland is a year-round park, it means the ride always has two trains available for operation, while the third train goes for its yearly rebuild. As far as capacity goes, a few sources online say that Edge Nika has a theoretical capacity of 1,000 riders per hour. With the ride's 20 passenger trains, this requires 50 dispatches an hour, which is a dispatch every 72 seconds. And this happens to be the exact amount of time between when a train dispatches from the station to when it disengages the lift hill. Hence why this is a theoretical capacity and not the ride's actual achievable capacity, as it would totally require three trains on the circuit to actually make that possible. With the ride crew dispatch dispatching on average every 5 minutes that equates to 12 dispatches an hour. And with the ride's 20 passenger trains, means an hourly capacity of 240 riders per hour. Yikes. And at a 6 minute dispatch interval, that's 10 dispatches per hour and 200 riders per hour. So yeah, if the park is busy and you can afford it, I highly recommend purchasing those Zekio priority passes. So that will conclude my review video of Edge Nika, which I believe is the world's most insane roller coaster. The ride is truly special, and I hope a large amount of the viewers watching this video are able to ride it at some point in their lives. I know traveling to a different country can be challenging, but Japan is an awesome place, and if you're a roller coaster fan, Edge Nika might be worth the trip to Japan just on its own. And to anyone watching who lives in Japan, please go ride at Janaika a bunch of times for me. I wish you luck with its line. Alright, thank you for watching everyone and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to comment down below what you think is the world's most insane roller coaster and your thoughts on 4th Dimension coasters. Also, be sure to like the video and subscribe for more, like my eventual problematic roller coasters video on X2. Alright, peace.